I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our investigation into the mystery of the Dyatlov Pass. Welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my Imperial co-host, Alice. Whoa, promotion. Have you been watching, like, The Crown or something? No, not that kind of Imperial. Imperial, like, (laughs) heavenly. The Imperial that starts with an E and has a Y in the middle of it. I did not actually know that this word existed. This is from Michael, so shout out to Michael who suggested that word. But it was so perfect that I had to use it. That, that, I was hoping that you promoted me to, like, you know, queen of an empire. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But that's pretty cool, too. Well, yeah. Sorry. You're just, you're just heavenly. You're not... <laughs> You're not, you're someone, not someone say, us all. <laughs> someone say the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate promotion. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I'm not ready to go yet. I'll get a big head, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alice's final appeal was answered. Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, lawyer. Well. Lawyer jokes. Lawyer jokes. Lawyer youth group <laughs> jokes. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, well, everybody, welcome back to this discussion of the Dyatlov Pass, something Alice and I were just talking about, something you probably shouldn't laugh about, but here we are, doing what we do. So, (laughs) thank you guys for uh, sticking with us and and coming back for this episode. I hope you guys are enjoying this so far, because this is my favorite case. So, if you don't enjoy this, you can't be a fan of the show anymore. So, that's just the way it is. Sorry if that means you have to leave us, but hey, that's life. Um, Last time... We, last time, I don't know. I don't know. We're kind of loopy today, I think, that, Alice. I, you know what? Um, I was just thinking about that. It's not like work was that hard today. We were loopy even at work, so I'm not sure what that says. Yeah, I don't know what's in the water. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I, well, I was telling Alice about. I gave up alcohol for Lent, so, you know, I guess this is just me with a clear head, so... <laughs> Oh, lucid, 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 uh, Brett. Yeah. Huh. It's like a whole new show. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be anyway. as fun. I know. And really, I feel like I should be drinking vodka for this show anyway. But I guess not. Maybe maybe in March, whenever Lent ends, we can revisit it. Or April? I don't even know. It's a long time. It's a long time. That's all I know. Anyway, so welcome back, guys. We Last episode, we went through the timeline of the Dyatlov Pass incident. Went through this incredibly bizarre story where these nine very experienced hikers ended up abandoning their tent in the middle of the night on the side of a mountain in incredibly cold, windy, dangerous circumstances and all died because of it and left a mystery that's never been solved and a mystery that's left a lot of questions and a lot of very confusing clues. Today, we're going to start going through those clues. We're going to start talking about some of the unusual aspects of this case. we got a lot to talk about. No way we're finishing today. It'll take a full episode just to talk about theories in this case. But we're going to go through those, and I hope you enjoy them. And I hope you will let us know what you think after you hear some of the things we're going to talk about today. So, Alice, you want to take it away? Sure. So we finished the timeline last time, and now we're moving on to unusual aspects So the first, we've already kind of touched upon it, but the Soviet shadow. Remember that this entire case happened under the rule of the Soviet Empire. This is the ultimate unreliable narrator case. Everything is open to consideration because truly nothing is certain. We really cannot know how much of the investigation was limited, misdirected, or covered up by Soviet authorities. 
And, you know, this is a historical case, so we have to just rely on what was written at the time. It could have been changed at the time. You know, what was written down may not have been what was actually um, happening, and we can't now interview those people. It's been too long. Now, because of the professions of some of the hikers, KGB were on scene during the search, and recovering the bodies was actually a state priority. This was not just some run-of-the-mill hikers lost on the mountain. These, as you remember when we described each of these hikers, many of them held um, what we would say, you know, in the United States, kind of top secret positions. They held (laughs) essentially state secrets to nuclear power and to what was happening inside of those plants. Now, if the valuable hikers had been kidnapped or had defected with state secrets, The KGB needed to know this because they had information in their minds that um, would be very valuable to another country who may have wanted to compromise the KGB. Now, thus, the facts we discuss are all, to a certain extent, in doubt. Yeah, and we're going to come back to this again and again. And even some of the people who investigated what was happening have talked about in subsequent years— the fact that their investigation was very quickly taken over by people from Moscow. And we're going to come back to that and come back to it over and over again. And it makes you wonder how compromised was this investigation? What facts are certain and which ones aren't? Those of you who like conspiracies, this is your case. Because this is a case where any conspiracy really is possible and Like I said, we're going to come back to that again and again. But as we discuss this case, just keep it in the back of your mind that nothing is certain. And this is really the worst possible situation in which you're trying to discover what happened. Truth was not a valuable commodity in the Soviet Union. Right. And especially, like we said, the individuals um, who were at issue in this case, the KGB had an interest in what those people knew or what they could have told other people. Now, so keep that in the back of your mind. I think that's just kind of the backdrop that we have to view all of the things we're going to then discuss. So the next unusual aspect is the left behind skis. The, le- the hikers left a pair of skis to mark the location of the Lebes. Remember, they were going to hike up. They had too many things. They were going to leave some supplies behind. So they had marked where they left their supplies with a pair of skis. But there's just one problem with this. The group had no spare skis or ski poles. So the fact that they left a pair of skis behind to mark the location of the Lebes is that one of the team members would have been left without skis. There was also a ski pole that had been cut up, found at the site of the tent. What? What's the purpose of cutting up a ski pole when they had no extra ski poles? To cut up this ski pole really hurts the group. Someone is left without skis and without a ski pole. And if you remember earlier, because of the terrain and because of the environment and the snow, they essentially are cross-country skiing. And for any of you who live in areas with a lot of snow, you can't get very far without skis, um, especially if uh, you're hiking up a mountain and time is of the essence. Your feet sink into the ground because you're too heavy. Skis spread your weight over a larger surface area so that you can glide over the snow as opposed to sink into it. So without these very important tools, essentially you are a sitting duck, you know, waiting for the elements to overtake you. Yeah. And, you know, this may not seem, we're sort of starting with, with something that may not seem all that important, but it is unusual, and it's really kind of inexplicable. We know they don't have any extra skis and ski poles because they'd actually requested extra ones from UPI when they were planning this hike, and you can imagine why, because if anything's damaged or broken, like Alice said, somebody is left without an ability to, to travel. So I don't know, and I don't think we'll ever know if maybe one of the hikers wasn't going to continue the hike at this point. If maybe they were going to stay behind, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because then why even mark the location of the extra items? Why not just have the person stay there at the laybeds and protect it or whatever? So I don't know what's going on here. This is something that gets mentioned a lot in a lot of the books on this, but kind of like us, there's no good explanation for it. 
there's no there's no good explanation for the cut up ski pole either and that's even even more inexplicable right because at least we know the purpose of the left behind skis they were to mark the location so they could find it again no idea why they cut up the ski pole so yeah that's so bizarre like what's the like what's the purpose of it even uh, you know it wasn't holding up the tent and a ski pole itself is not that long to begin with you know if if you needed the ski pole for something i'm just thinking out loud there wasn't ice fishing where they were but i can imagine maybe if you were trying to cook something over fire and you had no other devices maybe use a ski pole but you don't need to cut the ski pole to do that you know you can it might be awkward to hold a ski pole but you can finagle it and it's better not to cut it cuz then after you're done cooking your fish or whatnot you can keep using the ski pole. So I don't understand what the purpose of cutting a ski pole would be. It's one of those things where if you could figure it out, if you can figure any of this stuff out that we're going to talk about, maybe it gives you an idea of what's going on. You know, if you can figure out their mindset, what they were doing, what was important to them, what was happening around them, then maybe it would tell you something. There are people who think the cut up ski pole is a sign that they were attacked by someone and that whoever they were attacked by cut up the ski pole for the express purpose of preventing them from being able to use it. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is one of those weird things that does get discussed. And if anybody has an idea what the purpose of this would be, I certainly would be interested to hear it. Right. And note that, and Brett, you know, you may know more about this, but it says that the ski pole is cut up, not broken, right? If it were broken, I can imagine maybe they got into a scuffle. Two two of them got really heated and they started beating each other up. One of them hit the other with a ski pole and it broke. But I don't think that the ski pole is broken in a way that it had shattered um, as if you hit something forcefully, but rather had been that's intentionally correct. cut that way. And that's even more confusing. Right. It was cut so, with a knife. Right. Right. I mean, that's just, that's not from a fight. That's not an accident. Right. It was, it was, it was, whatever happened to it was definitely intentional. So the next thing we're going to mention, and we mentioned this a little bit when we're going through it in the timeline, is Rimple. You may recall this is an individual that the hikers talked about or talked to about the conditions on the mountainside and how rough they were. It actually ended up affecting their, the path they were going to take. And so here is the statement that Rimple would eventually make to the police. And his full name, by the way, is Ivan Dmitriev Rimple. He was, at the time, 53 years old. On January 25th, a group of hikers came to me and showed me their route, asking what would be the best route to the summit of Mount Otorton. Now, Mount Otorton is where they are going. Uh, Kolat Sokol, which we've talked about mostly, is where they hiked. So the plan was to sort of go over or kind of around this first mountain into the pass, which is now called Dyatlov Pass, and then travel on to Mount Ortorton, summit it, and then come back and go back the way they came. And they also asked me if they could see my own map of the area. While I was looking over their route, I told them it is dangerous to go on the Urals Ridge in winter because there are deep crevasses and some holes where one can fall. Anyway, the winds there are so severe they can actually blow people down. But they just told me this kind of expedition would be graded at the highest level of difficulty. I told them to go ahead. I showed them my map. They checked it against their own map and noted some edges and boundaries of the woods in that area. I advised them to take a closer route along one of our forest rides. They told me they would decide when they reached the second Severini mining camp. I think they could only have died from a natural disaster and climate conditions. I don't think the Mansi would have hurt them. I met them all the time, and they are always friendly and hospitable. From what old people have told me, there have been a number of people that perished while trying to cross the Ural Ridge before. Mansi live in the area, but they don't have their sacred stones or secret places in that spot. So all in all, this is a helpful guy. He's somebody who helped the hikers out, helped them plan their ascent. So why is his name the only thing written in Zena's diary, the last entry of Zena's diary, several days and many miles after he supposedly last spoke to the hikers. You know, Brett, when you read his statement, what came to mind, you know, of course, everything shaded. Who knows if Rempel is telling the truth or not. But based on his statement, it struck me that the hikers were a little bit stubborn um, and a little bit um, hard-headed, that they weren't really looking for anyone to comment on their map. They just 
wanted to plow ahead with their course because at the end of the day, they wanted to get the highest level of difficulty. And they, you know, whatever Rempel said, it didn't seem like it was going to change their minds. And so essentially, they just wanted it blessed. Maybe, you know, check their maps against his, make sure, you know, certain things are accurate, where the forest line is, where the edges are, but they weren't going to change the path if it meant it was going to jeopardize the, uh, the level of difficulty for their hike. And I wonder if his statements to them about how dangerous it was going to be was more forceful. And maybe there was some, you know, maybe there were some people in the group who were like, guys, maybe we should listen to Rempel. And maybe Rempel's name is actually a, a shorthand for we shouldn't do this. This is too dangerous. People fall, people die, the winds can blow you over. This is this is foolish. We should take another path, like Rempel suggested. And, you know, that's that's a really interesting thought. At the time that Dyatlov is writing the last entry in the group diary, he's talking about that very thing, about how windy it is and how cold it is and how difficult it is and how they're barely able to move and moving at a very slow pace. So that's a good thought, that it's possible that... When Zena writes this in her diary, that's exactly what she's doing. She's like, man, Rimple, we should have listened to that guy. The other possibility is, and, and I don't know how likely this is, but remember, Rimple knows exactly where they're going. I mean, they've, they've laid it out for him. So, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen it suggested that Rimple was involved in this, but it is interesting that he's the last thing that Zena writes about. So more about Rimple. Rempel at the time was a forestry officer in the Vise area where they were. And so he was an expert on this area and he had become an expert on the area because he had actually served time in the gulag that was nearby. There were many prison camps in this area and Rempel had been convicted of some crime. It's not entirely clear what it was in the thirties and had been sent to the work camp in Vise. And like many people who survived the work camps and, and survived to the end of their time, he never returned to his home. He just stayed there and used the expertise he had developed to to get a job. So that's what he was doing in the area. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's one of those things. He gave a statement, but he's not around for anyone to talk to now. Right. And, you know, it's interesting that he comes and of course, because the Mansi live in this area, they are probably at the top of investigators' minds of, you know, could the M Mansi have done anything? And he comes to their defense. This is just a statement, meaning he's giving his version of the story, so it's not a question and answer. So maybe he knew that the Mansi were being looked into or that naturally they would be, you know, suspects of uh, if there was any foul play. But he does come and jump to their defense in his statement. That could mean anything. He could really believe that. He, you know, he. it seems like he knows the Mansi well. I, I, I just note that he, he's not only, he, he doesn't seem to be um, trying to lead the police anywhere. You know, we talked about this with the Hinter Kaifek case where if someone is giving a statement to the police, there, there's a few statements you can make. And one of the statements you can make is to try and give police leads, especially if for some reason you think that it would lead them in the wrong direction. Here, he's not trying to lead the police anywhere. He's actually trying to cross off theories for them. And we're going to talk about the Mansi a lot more as we continue on this. They were a natural first suspect for several reasons. Some of them racist, some of them political, some of them because they had the opportunity to do this. Uh, Rempel does come to their defense. And look, Rempel would have known that if the Mansi were tagged with this, if someone decided that the Mansi did this and killed eight Russians, eight important people, the reprisals against the Mansi probably would have been quite severe in the Soviet Union at the time. So that is interesting. We're going to come back to that and talk about that more. But all in all, I do think it seems like Rempel was just sort of a helpful guy in the area. It's still weird, the the Xena part. But I think Alice may have the best suggestion for why Xena was writing that. It was a, sort of a reminder to come back to, man, we should have listened to this guy. Now, another unusual aspect. Now, this just sends chills down my spine. The cuts in the tent. 
The tent had both a back and a front door. And remember, they had one big tent that they all slept in. And now likely because of the speed and difficulty with which they were working that evening, the front of the tent was actually facing upslope, which is not ideal. The crime lab in Yekaterinburg would later confirm a seamstress's initial assessment. There were cuts made in the tent from the inside. This has led many to speculate that the hikers were so eager to get out of their tent that they didn't even bother to untie the flaps to leave. They didn't even have that much time. They had to take out their knives and slash through the tent. One, another thing to note about this, this is kind of like the ski pole. If they slash through their tent, sure, maybe they have brought along needle and thread and can fix it for the next night. But I don't know if you've ever tried to sew a needle and thread with gloves on and if you know how cold it is out there if their hands were exposed to do that it, it, I mean you couldn't work very quickly in other words if they're slashing their tent from the inside this tent is not going to be very good when they need it next which would be the next night and so this has to be such a desperate situation that it feels like life or death that they have to slash their shelter to get out into the elements which the tent is supposedly protecting them from and, an, and another thing that supports the fact that they probably didn't have much time to get out is not only did they slash through the tent, but they actually cut the side that is facing downslope. Because if they had time, you can imagine they would untie the uh, front, which is facing upslope, come out, then walk around the tent and go downslope. So they were just essentially busting out of their tent as quickly as possible to run downslope. There are a couple things that are interesting about this. First, there were several shallow knife scrapes in the tent, indicating attempts to cut the tent that were unsuccessful at first. Moreover, the cuts were just that, cuts. There was no indication of cuts followed by a tear, as one might expect of someone opening up the canvas and then forcing their way out. So you can imagine if um, you, you stick it just so you can make a little opening and then you tear at it with your hands to rip the rest of the way open. There's nothing like that. There are just cuts. Furthermore, the items that were inside the tent were not in disarray. Nothing's knocked over. You know, crackers remain unbroken. A cup of cocoa was undisturbed. Um, basically, everything was in their place. So it's not like there was a fight inside or someone had busted in and was terrorizing them or an animal had gotten into the tent. Nothing like that. Everything looked fine on the inside. So if there had been a rush to leave the tent, it was the most orderly rush ever. Nothing was disturbed inside the tent. No one tore at the cuts that were made with the knives to get out faster. It's like they just kind of vanished out inexplicably yeah you know this is kind of like i think back to when we looked at the the uh, story of the lighthouse keepers and how there's always that story about you know the food was in place and you know the it was even it was still hot and all that all that kind of thing that people talk about whenever they're talking about abandoned ships or abandoned lighthouses or anything Apparently, that's actually essentially what they found when they found this tent. The One of the investigators said it looked like they had just made food. They just sat down to eat when whatever happened, happened. And, you know, the, the story about the crackers, that there are whole crackers there. They're not, they're not crushed. They're not broken. This cup of cocoa is sitting there undisturbed. It just doesn't look like in the tent that there was this chaos that you might expect when you're thinking somebody is is literally slashing through the tent to try and get out of it now you've if you go to dietlofpass.com you can see pictures of this tent the tent has been lost like so much of the evidence in this case we don't have it anymore the pictures of the tent look kind of crazy i mean it really is just sliced up now one of the problems though is when the searchers found the tent they actually cut the tent some more to, to get into the tent and remove a lot of the items of the hikers. So the exact extent to which the tent was cut up is disputed. There are some people who think this is way overstated. I mean, this is one of those things that really makes this case bizarre and unusual and really captures the imagination of people, this idea, like Alice said, cutting through the tent. I mean, this is your safe area 
in a place that's negative 20, negative 30 degrees Celsius, really, really cold, and you've destroyed it, you're not going to be able to fix it. Um, now, they did repair the tent over time. The tent would develop tears and, and holes and other things. So they were capable of doing small repairs, but we're not talking small repairs here. We're talking you just slice through the tent. The tent is destroyed. So, but we don't know how much of that is true. There is the the weirdness of these sort of shallow cuts that make you think it actually took longer to cut the tent than this sort of rushed attempt would make you think. And the lack of tears is strange because you would think you would cut the tent and no matter what, as people are leaving, they would tear the tent. So what that means, I don't know. We're going to come back to this a lot. This is one of those things that we're going to talk about a lot. And you know, Brett, like with nine people, um, you know, this is a large enough tent that there can be nine people, but it's not much larger than uh, being able to fit nine people. So you would think if they had to get out so quickly that they had to cut, there would be kind of pushing like me first, just out of panic. Think about, you know, why you don't yell fire in a crowded movie theater is because there's only so many exits and a lot of people get pushed down. They're trying to get out first out of panic. And you would expect the the cup of cocoa to have tipped over, that someone would have stepped on some crackers, bumped, a, you know, bumped journals off of a table or uh, messed up sleeping arrangements, grabbed, you know, you're going too slow out that one cut. I'm going to tear this part uh, and run out this way. None of that happens. And that's why if this was a panic, it really was the most orderly rush ever. And there's more evidence of that as we sort of, as we sort of walk through this, what's happening. So if you think they're in a panic, you, you go back, we talked about the avalanche theory before, and this is part of the avalanche theory is they either thought an avalanche was coming or some sort of avalanche had, had come. They had to get out of the tent as quickly as possible. They're slicing through the tent and then rushing out into the night, right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. And, and when this is discussed, when this case is talked about, whether it's on podcasts or YouTube or, or whatever, you are always presented with this idea of the hikers rushing out into the night and then rushing down the mountain into this forest. And that is, that's not what happened. And in fact, it's not even really possible for that to have happened. There's a feeling out there that the group ran down the hill, not too far from their campsite, into the trees. That's not true. The cedar that we talked about last time is one mile from where the tent was located. That is a really long way. And it's a particularly, in particular, it's a really long way to rush anywhere. Like if you were just going to run off and panic, a mile away is a, is a good distance. And it's not only down the hill, but you actually have to go down the hill and then back up a slope to what some have described as up a 15 foot cliff. So this is a difficult trek. It's not just fleeing downhill. Then you're having to go uphill, kind of scale this cliff to where the cedar is located. Remember, even with their skis, even with their clothes, all that stuff, that last day, they were only traveling around 1.5 kilometers an hour. So that means on this night, assuming they traveled that fast, it would have taken them an hour to reach the area where they built the fire. And this is in negative 30 degrees weather. Given these facts, a panicked flight is almost impossible. Even if they did panic, they would have come out of that panic eventually. They would have come to their senses, particularly in this cold weather. And they certainly would have done that before an orderly, hour-long descent down the slope. And this was an orderly descent. When people talk about the footprints, essentially, and we're going to talk about this more later, essentially... The hikers were walking in a straight line. They weren't rushing down the hill. They were traveling down the hill in the same way they traveled up it, in a straight line, which does not fit with this idea that they were panicked. I mean, Brett, you know, as we're recording right now, I think by the time these are released, it's going to be much warmer around the country. But right now, you know, I think Texas is going through a deep freeze and people in many parts of Texas, millions of people have been without water, heat, electricity for days now. And they're in about, they're, they're in the teens right now. They're in like 19 degree weather. And 
you know, people. I have lots of friends there who have been texting me pictures of everyone crowded around fire. A lot of people have been getting monoxide poisoning by bringing in grills and other sort of heating devices from outside in a desperate attempt to stay warm in their houses that are dropping very close to 30 degrees. This is negative 30 degrees. And they are wearing essentially nothing. They are in their uh, underwear, uh, if even that. And they are out there for an hour. I mean, this is the type of, and they are experienced. They know that they cannot survive in these elements without proper clothing, without proper tools, without a fire going. And for them to, I can understand the initial panic. Let's, this didn't happen based on how the tent was found. But if a bear had barreled into the tent, they screamed, you have to get out, you run a mile that takes an hour, that's not what you would do. You would run out and then turn around. Yeah, the animal people often point to is a wolverine, actually. That is one of the theories, is that a wolverine got into the tent. You know, that's the that's the most polite wolverine in the world. Doesn't even knock over you know, a cup of cocoa. <laughs> I, I'm serious, though. Um, d- you know, you have a dog. You know how their tail goes. Um, especially if something smells delicious, they're not going to leave it unturned. And I think what you're saying is actually really important because one thing I think is clear from this is whatever it was that led them to leave the tent was real. It wasn't imagined. So, you know, the corollary of the avalanche theory, if you don't think there was an avalanche, is, okay, fine, there was an avalanche, but they thought an avalanche was coming. They believed it was coming, and that led them to panic, and they left, and it was only... You know, once they reached the forest floor, they realized there's no avalanche. And by then it was too late. But no, they would have had a lot of time to realize there's no avalanche or there's no, you know, whatever it was, whatever it is you think that drove them into a panic, they would have been able to realize that. And the cold would have made them realize it very quickly because they left everything behind. So the decision to continue to go down that hill in the cold was one that had to be based on something real. This is not panic-induced, and I think that's supported by the orderly way in which they traveled, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. When they did get all the way down the slope, they built a campfire. So this is where the first bodies were found. This is essentially underneath this cedar tree that we've talked about a lot. Interestingly, the campfire still contained a large number of partially burned and even unburned logs. Experienced outdoorsmen who were present estimated the fire had burned for only about 90 minutes. But they also said that they could not understand why the fire had gone out. It did not appear that this fire should have burned out on its own. And given its apparent size and the heat it would have generated, the hikers had defeated the biggest challenge they faced— getting a good fire going. And so the searchers thought that given that the fire was started and it had taken a lot of matches to start it because they had seen a lot of uh, burned matches around the area, that the only thing that could have happened is that someone extinguished the fire at some point. But who would have done that? Surely not the hikers. Even if they had decided to abandon the fire for a more sheltered location, such as the snow den that that was found near some of the other bodies, why take the time to extinguish the fire? Why would that be a priority? Yeah, that's really eerie, Brett, because obviously in these elements, I would think, oh my goodness, thank goodness we have this big fire going. We will not freeze to death. So the only thing I can think of to put out a life-giving source in these elements is because what does fire give off? Smoke. And smoke can alert people to where you are. So were they trying to ev- evade detection? And it was so important that they had to extinguish the, the life-giving fo- force of this fire that could have kept them alive. And you got to remember, one of the things that they're doing, or what it appears that they're doing, is they would built this fire right near the cedar tree. And they had been climbing up the cedar tree. We know that because their limbs broken off. There's skin embedded in the cedar tree. It's even possible maybe some of the injuries we've talked about could have occurred when someone fell from a, you know, way up the cedar tree. It's been said that from that height, 
you would have been able to see the tent. So one possibility is that they built this fire and they've got people climbing up the cedar tree to look back at the tent and observe it. And why would they be doing that? Makes you wonder. I mean, one of the theories we're going to talk about is that this is not a natural event, that this is, this is very much a true crime, that someone did this to them. And that makes you wonder if they're looking at the tent because that's where the people are. And maybe they were afraid that someone was going to see the fire or see the smoke and come after them. That is one possibility. Now, let's talk about the items that are unaccounted for. In the cedar area, a long piece of cloth used by soldiers to wrap around their boots for warmth was found. But it's unclear where this piece of cloth came from or whose it was. I mean, none of them are soldiers, Brett. So it's, of course, possible that this cloth had been there all along and it had nothing to do with them. But this is not a, an oft-traversed area. This is not even really part of the path that they had mapped out for their hike. Yeah, and... I mean, the only one who has any military experience is Zolotarov. But the interesting thing about this is they find this one piece of cloth, but they don't find another one, right? So you would imagine that in the tent with the stuff would have been the other piece of cloth that you used to wrap your other boot if it was one of theirs. And that's led some people to believe that this is evidence that soldiers were in the area and possibly there that night and that maybe this is some sort of military operation gone wrong. One problem with this is, once again... Very poor investigation. This may very well belong to a soldier who lost it, but they could have lost it when they found the bodies. And since no one preserved the scene, and honestly, it, it, in the beginning, this was a rescue mission, not a criminal investigation, so you can imagine how this would have gone wrong. But it's possible that that's the answer, that the reason this piece of cloth is there is actually innocuous. There were a lot of soldiers involved in the search. It certainly could have been that. But if it's not that, and it's not one of the hikers, then you can understand why this piece of evidence has become so evocative for so many people, because it could be a sign of what actually happened there that night. And next, the footprints. The story is often told that the group rushed down the hill, but that appears not to be the case. We've already talked about this a little bit, but around the tent were few individualized footprints as it appeared that the group remained in a group in the immediate vicinity of the tent. But then the footprints began to fall into a straight line of tracks heading downhill. So we're reading these footprints. This is really all that's left um, to try and recreate what happened. So imagine this. They cut their way out of the tent. They stay as a group and they're kind of right around the tent. But then... They all stretch out into a straight line to go downhill. Sometimes it appeared that the group, they were some of them were walking side by side rather than in a single file that would be expected in hiking. But it also seemed that at other times, some of them would veer off to the side and then return to the group. The question must be asked, were they being herded down the hill? So you can imagine, you know, Think about these tracks. It's not just a straight line going all the way down. Imagine sometimes they're walking together and then they fall back into a single file line. Some people kind of veer to the right, left, but then they always come back to the straight line. So maybe they're veering off and someone says, get back in line. They get back in the line. Now, the stride length indicated that the hikers were not running, but rather walking at a normal pace. Searchers disagreed as to how many sets of footprints there were. Most were either barefoot or only wearing socks. Again, negative 30 degrees here. At least one person, though, was wearing boots. Can you imagine walking at a normal pace in bare feet in that weather, though? It, you know, this, I think that leads me to believe that maybe there was some sort of hurting. Don't run, right? If you're being herded, you don't want to make sudden movements. You don't want them to think that you're trying to make a run for it. Also, you're forced to keep walking. You know, you don't get to stop. I think of my toddler, you know, if he steps in a puddle and his shoes are not waterproof and all of a sudden his feet are wet and cold, he stops in his tracks and he refuses to keep moving. I have to, you know, come on, got to keep going. He's like, I can't, my feet are wet. I can imagine if your bare feet, they are, you've lost feeling in them and you're in this snow, at some point you may want to stop walking, but they keep walking for an hour and that, you know, I can imagine that may be because someone is making them keep walking. 
I think this is one of the most telling things about this case. I remember learning about this case. I did not learn about this though until well into that and sort of learning about the case. It was well into it. And it was one of those things that really shocked me because it doesn't make sense and it doesn't fit with anything that you're told about what happened. As we said earlier, we are told that they're in such a rush that they're cutting through their tent, that they're rushing out into the night and then down the slope to the shelter of the trees. And yet it appears in reality, they left the tent sort of gathered outside the tent and then began to walk at a normal pace down the hill in essentially a straight line, sometimes veering off, but being brought back. Oh, and they're doing this barefoot or in socks. It's crazy. I mean, it, it, it doesn't fit with, with the panic aspect. Because if, if they are in a panic, why are they walking? And, and why in a straight line? You know, why are they not moving as quickly as possible down this hill trying to reach the cedar tree? Especially if there's an avalanche rolling down the hill or whatever, or they fear an avalanche is coming. They're taking their sweet time about it. And, and they're doing this even though they have to know that their chances of survival at this point are so slim. They're not stupid. <laughs> they, and yet... They have taken no time. On the one hand, they're not panicked. They're not running. They're walking. They're walking in a straight line. On the other hand, they haven't taken a few minutes, a couple minutes, to grab some clothes, to grab their boots, even if just their boots, even just to reach inside the tent and grab the boots, put the boots on before they start walking down this hill. And <laughs> none, none of the sort of conventional theories for what's going on here explain to me why they would do this. I, I just don't, this, this part is insane to me. I mean, it really just makes no sense. Now, there are eight or nine pairs of footprints here. There's a number of footprints you would expect um, from the hikers. Nobody can agree on exactly how many there were, but there weren't 30, for instance. And everybody always says that there were no footprints indicating that anybody else was there. So, if they were being herded, then it was done by somebody who avoided leaving footprints. Now, the footprints don't all go all the way from the tent down to the tree. They only last, they last for a good bit, long enough to be able to tell what's going on here, but not long enough that it's not possible that somebody else was, was with them and either covered up their tracks or the tracks just weren't preserved. One thing that is interesting we're talking about eight or nine sets of footprints here. That would seem to indicate everybody is walking on their own. There is no indication that anyone was being dragged or carried or assisted here. It appears they were all walking on their own. Remember the injuries we talked about. Crushed ribs. Luda has a rib through her heart. According to medical examiners, these injuries would have killed them within five to ten minutes. Fifteen tops. They're walking for an hour down the hill. So whenever those injuries happened, they didn't happen in the tent. They happened somewhere else. And that's something else to remember. That's a great point. I hadn't thought about the possibility of them carrying them, you know, carrying injured people. But no, it seems like at this point, no one is so injured that they can't walk themselves, nor were they being carried away by somebody or being dragged away against their will. Now, let's talk about their clothing. Many of the campers were found either wearing not much clothing or wearing each other's clothing. Each other's clothing. Yuri Kravonashenko, for instance, was only wearing one sock. Rustem was only wearing one boot. Luda was wearing a piece of uh, Yuri Kravashenko's wool pants wrapped around her foot. Zolotarov, on the other hand, was probably dressed well enough to survive the night with only minimal shelter. That's a huge range of what they are wearing. And, you know, having one sock, one boot, that indicates to me that you left in a hurry. Maybe you had time to pull on one boot. Maybe you were in the middle of getting undressed to go to sleep for the night, so you only had one sock before you had to run out into the snow. That all indicates to me that there was a lot of rush. But again, the circumstances of the footprints and the lack of tears in the tent is strange because if you're moving so fast that you would leave behind something as important as a boot, you would think there would be more disarray within the tent. 
But then some of them, you know, at least one of them was dressed incredibly well. So, you know, what caused the variance in their dress? All of them would have known they needed to be dressed well to go into the night. And we're going to come back to this again and again, but one of the things this seems to indicate, and there are other things that indicate this as well, is that some of the hikers were inside the tent. Whenever whatever happened, happened. Some of the hikers were inside the tent. They were getting undressed. They were getting ready to go to bed, or they already were in bed. Some of the hikers were not inside the tent. They were outside the tent, and they were well-dressed. And Zolotarov is probably the best dressed. And let me just go through what he was wearing, just so you have an idea. I mean, you know, we talked about Yuri Kravonashenko now. Some of this is a little misleading because we believe that the hikers actually took some of the clothes off of the two Yuris uh, after they had died to try and provide them a little bit better chance to survive. Luda having that wrapped around her foot is an indication of that. But here's what Yuri was wearing when he was found. A blue checkered cotton shirt, cotton white shirt, white pants made of material torn and charred in places, blue satin swimming trunks. On the left foot, the toe of a cotton sock is torn and in some places charred. So that's it. That's all he had. Like almost nothing. A couple shirts, a sock, <laughs> and, that, and that's it. And, you know, no wonder he died first. No matter what he was wearing when he died, he obviously was one of the least dressed people at the time. Compare that to Zolotarov. Zolotarov had a leather hat with ear flaps, uh, trimmed with fur, sports, woolen knitted hat of red color with three light stripes. So he's actually wearing two hats, brown and blue checkered woolen scarf, uh, a mask made out of uh, tarpaulin, a fur vest of black sheepskin, a brown sport jacket with buttons, black cotton sweater, sports cotton blue sleeve t-shirt, cotton jersey cherry colored t-shirt, khaki canvas jumpsuit pants, blue ski pants, another pair of ski pants with elastic bands, black quilted boots, brown wool socks, gray cotton swimming trunks, blue satin briefs. So he's wearing, he's wearing a lot of clothes. Like he's wearing the kind of clothes you would expect to be wearing if the weather was that cold. And the comparison between him and what some of the others were wearing is just, it's stark. And that's Zolotarov. We talked about Rustam and how he's only wearing one boot, but Rustam's wearing four shirts, four pairs of pants, and four pairs of socks in, in addition to his one boot. Well, he only has one boot, you know, who can say? But he's wearing, you know, a good amount of clothes. Zena, Zena's another one. Zena's got a decent amount of clothes on. She's wearing four shirts, five pairs of pants, if you include her, her underwear, and three socks and two hats, right? So some of the people have a lot of clothes on, maybe not enough to survive in this weather, but at least to give them a fighting chance. And then there are people who have almost nothing on and... It is weird, and it indicates that everyone was sort of in a different state and doing different things. But one thing that's for certain is when they left, they did not stop to dress. If you didn't have the right clothes on, that was just going to be tough. You were going to have to try and make it like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of that except that it, you know, we, we've talked about this earlier, is that as their uh, fellow hikers were dying, they were trying to take whatever clothes they could um, because the clothes were not going to do their past, you know, friends any good, that they were just piling on whatever clothes they could get off of their dead bodies to have a fighting chance to either build a fire, find shelter, or make it back to supplies. This story is really divided into two parts. There's what happened at the tent and there's what happened afterwards. Whatever happened at the tent, they had to get away from the tent. They weren't rushing away from the tent, but they had to get away from it. Once they got to the cedar tree, then it was about surviving. And they could do things like, you know, when a friend died, undress them and, and, and use those clothes. You know, when they were up at the tent, they couldn't even take five minutes to make sure that Yuri or that Rustam had both boots or that Yuri had some shoes. You know, they couldn't do that. They had to get away from the tent, either because something was happening at the tent or because they were forced to go away from the tent. 
And then they get down to the cedar tree and they're building a fire and they're climbing the cedar tree, looking back at the tent and building a snow den. And then at some point, three of them decide to try and make it back to the tent to get the things that they had left behind. The things that they didn't have time to get before, they're now going to take the mile long trek up the mountain in the cold without proper equipment. That's how important it is for them to get back to the tent. They have to get back to the tent. They know that. But when they were at the tent, they couldn't take five minutes to get the stuff they needed. So what was going on there? What was happening there that would have put them in that circumstance? I mean, that's the million-dollar question, and it only gets more confusing when you start talking about the condition of the bodies when they were found. This is the last thing we're going to talk about today, and we're going to leave you with some crazy stuff because when you look at the condition of the bodies, it, 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 it becomes even more mind-blowing. Now, a lot of you guys know about some of the crazier things, like the fact that Luda was found without a tongue. A lot of people dismiss that and say, well, that's probably the result of animal predation or bacteria in the water. She was found face down in a flowing river. Any number of things could have happened there, and people sort of dismiss that. That's weird, and it's creepy, and I understand why people focus on it. It is not the most interesting injury that you see on these folks. So let's talk about that. So autopsies are performed on every one of the hikers. These autopsies have been criticized. It's hard to trust them completely. There are times when information appears to be copied from one autopsy to another, which makes you wonder how thorough these were. Unusually, the head prosecutor for the area was present at every autopsy, which is something that no one remembered happening before or since this occurred. So all these autopsies, good or bad, do reveal interesting details. And you can kind of divide the group in half. Doroshenko, Kravonoshenko, Zena, Dyatlov, and Rustam, the five who were found first, they were all determined to have died of freezing to death, which you can sort of understand given their circumstances. But... Luda, Zolterov, Alexander, and Tavo, they had the four people who were found last. They generally had pretty severe physical damage done to them, and their deaths are attributable to trauma, not cold. Now, here's some of the weird things about this case and some of the weird findings of this autopsy. Many of the bodies showed abrasions on their eyelids, and this has led some to speculate that they were blindfolded that final night, and that was the cause of the abrasions. Now, it's also possible they were caused through things like falling in the snow, though one wonders how that would cause abrasions on their eyelids. The Atlov's knuckles were bruised, and the general agreement on this is they were bruised in the typical way of someone who had been in a fist fight. Also, on Dyatlov's palm was a cut one to two or 0.1 to 0.2 centimeters deep, which, according to a modern Russian forensic pathologist named Edward Tumanov, suggested that he could have grabbed a knife, and that's what resulted in the cut. In addition to that, Zena also had wounds on her fist that suggested she had been in a fight. Yuri Doroshenko had a swollen and split upper lip, and Yuri Kravonoshenko had a contusion on his head that appeared to be from being struck. Remember, these are the people who died of hypothermia. Yuri also had third-degree burns of his leg and on his hand. People have speculated that that was actually because he was so cold that he got too close to the fire and actually ended up burning himself, though some people disagree with that. It's also been said that Rustam... And Yuri Kravonoshenko had black eyes, indicating that they had been struck. Zena, this is interesting, had a narrow 12-inch long bloody bruise extending around her waist from her stomach to her back, which looked like to all the world as if she had been struck by a rod, possibly a baton. Or, or a ski pole. Or a ski pole. That's, that's true. That's also possible. But struck with something. And Luda had her hyoid bone broken, which often indicates someone attempted to strangle her. In fact, that's what you look for whenever you have strangulation. 
We actually talked about in the My Trace Richardson case, how they never found the hyoid bone, and that was a problem because it made it difficult for them to determine whether or not she had been strangled to death. I mean, Brett, what you've just described, it sounds, you know, we know that the cause of death for these five was due to freezing to death, but you have just described what sounds like a fight, a rumble. You know, there's bruises, and a serious one. Um, a 12-inch long bloody bruise extending from your waist to your stomach is uh, a lot. You know, that's a really big bruise. Cuts in your hands, especially when you're out in these elements, um, from probably cut, uh, grabbing a knife. That would make sense because otherwise when you're outside of the tent, you're typically wearing gloves. And your hands are to some degree protected from cuts from ice or rocks or, you know, other sorts of sharp devices that could cut you. Um, but for all of them to have kind of these bar fight sorts of injuries is very interesting, especially when none of these injuries are serious enough to have caused them to die. Right. And yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it seems to indicate, that there was a fight. Now it's possible you can imagine a situation in which, you know, say that a Dyatlov thought there was an avalanche coming and he forced them all out of the tent and they all went down the hill and then they got to the bottom of the hill and they realized there was no avalanche and they're like pissed off at him and they're like, you've murdered us or whatever. And they got in a big fight and they got in a fight with each other, right? I mean, you could imagine that being what caused this. I think that's unlikely, particularly, you know, I don't think Dyatlov was strangling Luda and I don't think he was striking... Zena with a rod or with a ski pole. I don't think either one of those things was happening. I imagine there are possibly other explanations for these wounds, and there are for some of them. But when you put them all together, it's hard to believe that this was all just the result of them, you know, falling while they're walking down the hill. And also, most of these wounds happen before death. These are pre mortem wounds, and we know that because. You know, things like it's Xena's bruise contains blood. Dead bodies don't bruise. So that would have been something that happened to her while she was alive. And frankly, it only got weirder. There was an inquest held on May 28th, 1959, after they had found all the bodies. And there was a discussion about the last four bodies that were found. And the lead prosecutor, Lev Ivanov, interrogated a medical expert on what they had found. During one exchange, he asked about the extreme damage to Thibault's skull. Thibault died of a severe skull fracture, and here's what the medical examiner said. I don't believe these wounds could have been the result of him simply falling and hitting his head. The extensive, depressed, multi-splintered, broken fornix and base of the skull fracture could be the result of an impact of an automobile moving at high speed. This kind of trauma could have occurred if he had been thrown and fallen, and hit his head against rocks, ice, etc., by a gust of strong wind. So remember, this is one of the possibilities. Rimple had brought this up. There's just really powerful winds blowing. You have to imagine that he was sort of picked up by the wind and slammed against some sort of rock at extremely high speed. The expert was asked if he could have been hit with a rock, but the expert said that in this case, there would have been damage to the soft tissue, and this was not evident. This is another very strange thing about this case. Extreme damage to Thibault and the others, but no external injuries. It's hard to even imagine how the wind could have done this. Basically, his skull was completely shattered, and there was no indication of that on the outside of his body. The doctor's description of Luda and Zolotarov's injuries were even more striking. Quote, I think the character of the wounds on Dubinina and Zolotarov, a multi-splintered fracture of the ribs, on Dubinina, it was bilateral and symmetrical, and on Zolotarov, one-sided. Both had hemorrhaging into the cardiac muscle and hemorrhaging into the pleural cavity, which is evidence of them being alive when injured and is the result of the action of a large force, similar to the example used for Thibault. These wounds especially appearing in such a way without any damage to the soft tissue of the chest, are very similar to the type of trauma that results from the shockwave of a bomb. Well, Brett, 
a shockwave. I mean, here I'd been thinking about car accidents. There's clearly no cars up here, but or the wind or someone smashing another person's head against a rock. But here, you know, the doctor is introducing an altogether other possibility of these sonic booms that are so that are invisible to the eye, but so powerful that they can do this sort of peculiar damage where there is no soft tissue damage. I can't even imagine with such extensive wounds to not have soft tissue damage. There's a couple of interesting things about this. This doctor says this about the shockwave of a bomb. And Alice, if you were, if you were talking to an expert about something like this and you had them on the stand and they said something like that, <laughs> that it could have been, from the shockwave of a bomb, what would you do at that point? Oh, I'd follow up on what? What about that shockwave of a bomb? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just like... That is not <laughs> what the prosecutor did. <laughs> what did Instead, the prosecutor do? he immediately changed the subject. He immediately changed the subject. He immediately moved on. He did not want to talk about that possibility. And this sort of goes back to what's going on here. We're going to talk about this more, just the atmosphere in Russia. If this were a bomb, I mean, maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe this was just a very evocative way of describing it. But for the prosecutor, if it were a bomb, he did not want to know that. He did not want this to be a bomb. So he just moves on from this. That's the first thing that I think is interesting about this. The second thing is this is not consistent in my view with the idea that some people have put forward that this damage was done to these people because they all just sort of stumbled into a ravine. So their bodies are found in a ravine. They're found under a lot of snow, right? So one possibility you might imagine is they sort of stumble into the ravine. They fall 15, 20 feet. You know, they all hit rocks. They're sort of injured. And then maybe, you know, 15 feet of snow then falls on top of them and crushes them even more. That's really kind of the best you can do trying to think of a natural way for this to happen. There's a couple problems with that. People who have been to the site say that the area where the bodies are found, it is deeper than the surrounding area, but it's not, it's not like that. It's not like a cliff, right? Where they just sort of walked over the edge of the cliff and then fell 20 feet straight down. It's more like a slope. So the chances of them falling like that, not that great. Also, it's unclear how all this snow would have just fallen on top of them if that were the way this went down. Now, they were found under a lot of snow. How that snow moved on top of them, not entirely sure. Probably happened over time. It's in the mountains, after all. But whatever happened with the snow, the injuries were, once again, pre-mortem. So they suffered these injuries, and then they died later on. So it wasn't, for instance that they died in the ravine, and then the snow gradually covered them and crushed them. That's not what happened. Whatever happened to them, it had to happen to them while they were still alive. That's quite the note to end on, Brett. <laughs> Man. Yeah, so that's a lot. <laughs> we, we've covered a lot in this episode, a lot of the weird stuff, but we're not done. And there's even, even stranger things to come that we're going to talk about as we continue to move through this case. Hopefully, if you didn't know this case before, you know why it's so interesting now. There are so many things we've talked about that you could spend, if any one of these things were in a case, you would spend all your time thinking about those and trying to figure them out and figure out why they happened. And we're just piling weird thing on top of a weird thing, and we're going to continue to do that. And you're going to understand by the time we get finished why... You know, aliens may not even be the weirdest possibility for what happened to these people. But we have covered a lot. I'm sure you guys have thoughts, comments, questions. Shoot us an email at prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Prosecutorspodcast.com is our website. We'll have a links. We'll have links to a lot of things we've talked about. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Prosecutors Pod. We also hang out on Reddit and YouTube. I think you guys know we're pretty responsive. So looking forward to hearing, looking forward to hearing what you think about this case. Uh, if you're interested in having ad-free episodes, join us on Patreon. Also check out our store where all the proceeds continue to go to support the Cold Case Research Institute. 
Well, Alice, before we say goodbye for today, do you have anything else you want to add? No, guys, it gets more, more and more interesting and strange. Um, so come on back and you're going to love this next episode. Yeah. I mean, just when we talk about how one of the bodies was found holding a pencil and a piece of paper, those sorts of things. So strange. Can't wait to talk about this more with you next time. But until next time, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Another hiker was Nicolay Thibodeau Brignol, and we're going to call him Thibodeau. He was 23 years old. And he, Thibodeau. Thibodeau. Oh, Thibodeau. I was thinking of the New Orleans. Very Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> you know how, like, um, if, if you read words that are, have missing parts in the middle, your brain fills it in? Fill it in. Ekaterinburg. Ekaterinburg, of course. Ekaterinburg.